behalf of the Entomology Graduate Student Organization, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Pimentel. Uh, first, I want to thank all the organizations that helped co-sponsor Dr. Pimentel's visit, including the ISU Lectures Program, the Graduate College, the Pesticide Management and the Environment Program, the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, within the Leopold Center, the IPM, that's Integrated Pest Management Issue Team, the Bioethics Program, and the Center for Agricultural and Rural Development. Lots of organizations, we couldn't have done it without all of them. And this wide range of organizations uh, reflects Dr. Pimentel's wide range of interests. To describe Dr. Pimentel to you, I have to start by describing his uh, scientific credentials, which are pretty extensive. He's currently a professor of entomology, which is the study of insects at Cornell University. 50% of his appointment is in the Department of Entomology. Uh, to accommodate his wide range of interests, the other 50% of his appointment is as a uh, professor at large of agricultural sciences, um, including such things as energy use, soil erosion. Uh, this is the only such appointment at Cornell, so um, someone with an unusually wide breadth of uh, interests. He served as the chairman of the entomology department at Cornell for six years. He has authored over 400 scientific and technical papers, including having written two books, and having helped edit another 14 books. So in, in other words, this is someone who has really excelled in pretty much all the ways in which uh, scientists measure success. But that's not the main reason why the Entomology Graduate Student Organization invited him to speak tonight. What really distinguishes Dr. Pimentel is his willingness to take risks. And what I mean by that is his willingness to take public stands on controversial issues. This is something that not a lot of scientists <laughs> will do. It's, uh, it's not necessarily the safest road to professional recognition, but it's something that Dr. Pimentel has done consistently. By his example, Dr. Pimentel shows us that scientists have a special responsibility to educate the public because it's you, the public, that's going to have to make the decisions about where the balance lies between the costs and the benefits of pesticide use. And we're very pleased to have Dr. Pimentel here tonight to give you some of the information that you're going to need to, to make those decisions. His topic tonight will be economic and ecological benefits of sustainable agriculture. Dr. Pimentel. Thank you again for a very kind introduction, and I hope I'll live up to it. Uh, I'm going to uh, take one aspect of sustainable agriculture for emphasis, and that's on the subject of uh, uh, pest control, and uh, I will have a few other things in there. Uh, but uh, I think it well illustrates uh, some of the problems we have, the challenges, and also uh, some of the opportunities we have to change the system and make <coughs> agriculture environmentally sound. And I'm going to try to keep this to about uh, 45 minutes so that we can have uh, some time for uh, questions. I will be using uh, slides uh, to illustrate uh, the points that I hope to make. If you could turn those uh, on then. I put this, this first slide on to emphasize one point that we uh, have. I think we can make out with, uh, I think, the side lights on it. Uh, but anyway, is that we, one major problem and challenge that we have is uh, trying to provide food for a rapidly growing population. And is that the one? This doesn't seem to work. Can you? Either we're disconnected or <laughs> did you change it or I did? Okay. <laughs> anyway, the world population is 5.5 billion and we're, we add a quarter of a million people to the earth every 24 hours, a quarter of a million. 
uh, that have to be fed, and we already have a problem in feeding the numbers that we already have. 1.6 billion humans are malnourished on Earth today, with 2 billion living in uh, poverty. But even the U.S. Did I do that or you did that? You did it, all right. <laughs> Thank you, I'll rely on you now. Uh, the United States in 1850 had 23 million people, or less than the population of New York State today. In 1990, we went to 250 million, and I must admit that my number of 20 year 2070 is incorrect. That ought to be uh, because the world population, since I made this, uh, the U.S. population, since I made this slide uh, during the last three years, has increased. Uh, it's uh, well, due both due to immigration and rate of reproduction in the U.S. is now 1.1 percent per year. And so that should read now year 2050 that we will have a half a billion humans in the United States, assuming they don't increase further. Next slide. Now, our, our goal, of course, in, is uh, to produce high-quality food in the U.S. and elsewhere uh, to feed people. And the next slide. Uh, uh, few people appreciate the fact that the average American consumes uh, 1,500 pounds of food per year, uh, and I've got the calories and the so forth, three quarters of a ton of food per person per year in the U.S. And the next slide, we should be eating only about 1,000 pounds of food per year, and this shows you where that excess is uh, going. Uh, that's part of our National Strategic Petroleum Reserve. <laughs> Next slide. Now, to focus a little bit on, on some of the pests, and they do cause an enormous loss to our food system, not only in the U.S., but worldwide. Next slide. Uh, uh, although they're uh, attractive, I suppose, sitting in your corn, it's not of great benefit if you want to save that corn. Next slide. Worldwide, there are about 67,000 uh, pests that try to that sh uh, share our food, and that doesn't include the rodents or the mammals and the birds. And the plant pathogens obviously dominate the uh, uh, system. Next slide. Now, to try to control these pests and limit their uh, destruction of our food, Enormous amounts of pesticide are uh, used. Uh, next slide, 2.5 million uh, tons uh, worldwide, and the U.S. uses about a half a million uh, uh, tons of pesticide. And one way that we waste pesticide is the way we apply uh, the material. For example, by aircraft, uh, if you're spraying, and I want to emphasize now, this is under ideal conditions, and very seldom do they apply pesticides from aircraft by, under ideal conditions. Only 50 percent gets into the target area. I'm not talking to the target pest of the crop, I'm talking in the target area. And the new technology that's being adopted in aircraft application is called ULV, uh, or ultra low volume, and in those cases only 25 percent gets into the target area. And so the rest of this goes drifting off into our environment uh, to cause problems that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Next slide. Now, the actual amount of pesticide that reaches target pests is less than one-tenth of one percent, which means the rest of it is again in our environment, although a lot of this is in the uh, target area but it's still in our environment. Of course, some of that will move out of the target area in addition. Next slide. Now, in general, uh, pesticides do have a benefit. We in the U.S. spend $4.1 billion annually in pesticides, and it's estimated we save about $16 billion in crops. Uh, thus. For every dollar invested, we get about four dollars in return. But I want to emphasize now, that does not include, however, the public health and environmental costs of using pesticides. These are the direct benefits and that do not include any of the costs 
social or environmental that are involved in using pesticides. And I'm going to get into that issue in a moment. Next slide. Now, in the U.S., we lose, uh, in other words, despite the use of the uh, uh, 500,000 uh, kilos, the pesticide that we use, we lose 37% of all potential production to uh, uh, insects, diseases, and weeds. And incidentally, the world figure is 35%. Now, the reason, in part, we use a large quantities of pesticide but still lose, on average, slightly more than the world is the difference in cosmetic standards. For example, uh, a lot of the fruits and vegetables that you'd see on the Guatemalan market or in India would not be saleable in the uh, U.S., so this is all based on saleable products. And uh, this is, in part, why our losses are slightly higher than the uh, average in the world. Next slide. Now, some interesting data that indicates some of the problems that we're having and mismanagement, I, uh, I'll term it, is the crop losses due to insects. And these are USDA data. In 1945, before we started using the new synthetic insecticides, we were losing uh, about 7% of our crops to insects. And uh, uh, today, uh, am I standing in the way of this uh, projector? The, the lower part. The lower part. <laughs> All right. Let me stand over a little bit. Uh, you can still hear me? Okay. All right. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, and again, uh, the emphasize in 1945, uh, when we, we did not uh, use any synthetic insecticide, that's when we started. And we were losing 7% uh, of our crops to insects. In 1992, after insecticide use had increased tenfold, crop losses, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, are now 13%. In other words, nearly a twofold increase in crop losses due to insects with a tenfold increase in insecticide use. Now, uh, you might say, how the hell could that happen? Well, the reason is, uh, for the most part, changes in agricultural technology. Uh, some changes in cosmetic standards and their pesticide resistance and a few other problems. Next slide. And uh, destruction of natural enemies and, uh, and so forth. The next slide also illustrates a little bit better uh, using corn as an example related to the agricultural changes in agricultural technology. In 1945, for example, almost zero insecticide was used in, in uh, corn production. And today, corn is the largest user of insecticides in the nation. Beat out cotton about four years ago. Now, next slide. Uh, when we started, in 1945, most of the corn was grown in rotation, and we didn't have a problem with the corn rootworm uh, complex of, of insects. And today, about half the corn is grown in rotation and half is not. Next slide. And now, uh, with uh, corn uh, being the largest user of insecticides, there's been over a thousand-fold increase in insecticide use in corn production in the U U.S., and again, going back to uh, USDA next slide uh, data, that corn losses to insects, according to the USDA, have gone from 3.5% to 12% to uh, with a thousand-fold increase in insecticide use, and it's primarily due to a change in agricultural technology that is moving away from crop rotation. Next slide. Now. Uh, our land is extremely important to us, and I wish I could, uh, could have spent some time on the, on the soil degradation and soil erosion problem, uh, but uh, I'll leave that for a, uh, another time. Uh, but land is extreme. Next slide. Uh, few people appreciate the fact that 99% of the world's food comes from the land. Less than 
comes from the oceans and uh, freshwater aquatic uh, uh, systems. And so we should be very concerned about the, our soils and uh, the degradation of these soils uh, by uh, erosion and various other uh, means, including uh, highway construction, urbanization, and so forth. And you'd uh, appreciate the problem in part that during a 30-year period from 1945 to 1975 of just agricultural land, from highways and urbanization, we blacktopped over the equivalent area larger than the state of Ohio. That's just highways and urbanization. And if you took all the areas that were blacktop over over that period, it would be both Ohio and Pennsylvania, but the agricultural land alone was greater than the state of Ohio. Next slide. <coughs> now, when we do apply pesticides, as I uh, mentioned, by aircraft, and especially if they're near housing areas and so forth, you do have this serious drift problem and the impact of uh, uh, pesticides on uh, the public is significant. Next slide is world data uh, from WHO. The total number of human pesticide poisonings worldwide is about a million with 20,000 deaths. In the U.S., we also have a problem. Next slide. Uh, the human pesticide poisoning, 67,000. It's more than 67,000 each year uh, <coughs> with uh, 27 deaths. And uh, the estimated uh, cancers associated with pesticides, less, about 10,000 per year. So it is a significant public health problem in the U.S., uh, not as severe in the rest of the world, but certainly it's, it's, it's important. Next slide. Now, we also, when we use uh, pesticides, in particular insecticides, we do destroy some of the natural enemies, and this costs us money. The next slide uh, uh, gives an estimate of uh, the cost to the nation, that's U.S., uh, in the destruction of natural enemies, uh, estimated to be 520 million, or about a half a billion dollars. Next slide. And then pesticide resistance. These are world figures, about 504 species of insects uh, that are resistant, uh, and, and well, close to 900 total species of uh, uh, pests that have become resistant. And this is a very important uh, problem in the U.S. as elsewhere in the world. Next slide. Uh, oops, I guess I didn't have that number. But the, anyway, the estimated cost of resistance in the United States uh, is $1.4 billion annually. And this is due to extra pesticides, that's a treatment, increased crop losses due to the resistance problem. It's certainly a major environmental problem. And then, of course, pesticides do get into uh, streams and lakes and destroy fish. And uh, this is totally an underestimate, uh, but it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 30 million. The realistic figure is probably three or four times that. Next slide. And then uh, when we do use uh, uh, insecticides in particular, uh, honeybees and wild bees are uh, uh, killed, and uh, uh, that is a cost to the apiculturalists, and uh, it's also a cost to agriculture from the point of view of reduced pollination. Wild bees and honeybees are important to pollinating about $30 billion worth of agricultural crops annually. And it's uh, a conservative estimate is that uh, the impact of pesticides on tame uh, or honeybees and wild bees is about a little over $300 million annually. Next slide. And then uh, some other interesting effects that you can get when you're using pesticides is using, if you use an herbicide, <laughs> for example, 2,4-D on a crop such as corn, uh, that it uh, creates other pest problems. <coughs> that is, it may help control the weeds but you do create some other pest problems. And these are uh, data on corn showing that 
with 2,4-D at recommended dosages that the uh, corn leaf aphid population was nearly three times on the treated corn, that is treated with herbicide, than on the untreated. And another, uh, next slide, uh, the corn borers, for example, uh, were significantly more abundant on the treated corn, that is with 2,4-D, than the untreated, and furthermore, these corn borers grew 33% larger on the 2,4-D corn and produced 33% more eggs than the corn borers on the untreated uh, corn. And we also checked it out on two diseases, corn leaf blight and corn smut disease, and both were significantly increased. Well, actually, the corn lost its resistance to southern corn leaf blight when we exposed it to 2,4-D, and the corn smut disease was five times larger on the uh, treated corn. Those are the only <coughs> organisms we looked at. But it does show you the significance of the interaction of some of these uh, pesticides in the impact on pests. Next slide. Uh, we'll skip, that's in part some of the uh, changes that we observed. And then birds, uh, osprey and various other birds that uh, do become exposed to pesticides. Uh, next slide, the estimate is that uh, uh, pesticides are causing about $2 billion worth of damage to uh, birds using a very conservative estimate uh, that I explained to you if you'd like at some time. Next slide. And uh, then uh, groundwater and well water contamination, and I understand that it's a serious problem here in Iowa also. Uh, it's estimated that if we did an adequate job of monitoring well water and groundwater for pesticides, uh, that it would <laughs> cost the nation $1.3 billion annually. Now remember, that's strictly monitoring. It's not doing anything about the problem. Next slide. And then, of course, pesticides do reduce uh, species diversity, and it's estimated worldwide that uh, it's not due to, just due to pesticides, but due to all the factors, such as removal of forests, that we're losing about 150 species per day uh, due to our uh, various uh, changes uh, that humans are causing. Next slide. Now, the total environmental cost of using pesticides back to the United States, uh, we estimate to be at least $8 billion, or another way to put it, more than $8 billion annually. So it is a significant cost. Now, pesticides still are benef beneficial in terms of economics if uh, you factor <laughs> that in on the cost-benefit Originally, I told you that you get $4 return for a dollar invested. <coughs> well, if you would factor e even this $8 billion, now I realize that this is a conservative figure, this $8 billion, uh, but uh, if you factor it in, it still turns out that pesticides are a net benefit for the uh, nation. Now I'd like to turn, next slide, uh, to uh, what we can do in managing uh, uh, our pest control technology uh, to improve it and hopefully make it uh, more profitable. Next slide. And uh, the basic principles that I have related to sustainable agriculture is that we make maximum use of our biological resources and to minimize our energy inputs uh, in the system. In other words, actually minimizing our management uh, of these resources. Next slide. <laughs> and uh, related to uh, sustainable agriculture, in a study, that one study that we made, it does take more labor, especially if you're going to make use of livestock manure in the recycling in the system, and that is one <coughs> major problem in the U.S. is that we're not making effective use of that manure. It is polluting our water, it's polluting our surface waters, and wasting a very valuable uh, resource. Next slide. And we can confu uh, conserve fuel in this particular model situation related to corn. We are able to buy 
uh, so they being selective of the tractors and the equipment that we had reduced the total fuel input uh, from 115 liters uh, per hectare to 70, a major, uh, uh, well, about 40% reduction in fuel inputs. Next slide. And then our actual corn yield in this particular system, we were actually able to increase the yield in the sustainable system. We were using a crop rotation system uh, here, and so that we were able to get a higher yield and uh, with uh, no insecticide being used in this particular system. Next slide. Now, as far as energy goes, we were able to, in fact, reduce the total energy inputs by one half, that is from 7.8 million uh, kilocalories per hectare to 3.7 million kilo kilocalories per hectare, reduce soil erosion from 20 tons per hectare to one, <coughs> and uh, obviously reduce the water runoff and reduce the amount of pesticide being used in this particular system. Next slide. Now, dollar-wise, it was also the cost of production were reduced from $523 per hectare to $352 per hectare, and that does include the additional labor, uh, the 20, uh, I'm sorry, 20 percent more labor that we had in that uh, system. Next slide. Now, related to pesticides, uh, four countries, if you include uh, Canada, uh, Ontario and Canada as a country, uh, have made the decision to reduce pesticide use by 50 percent. And uh, Denmark was the first country uh, to do that, and Sweden the second. And Sweden in 1992, uh, last year, had already achieved their 50% reduction in pesticide use, and this year they've implemented another program to achieve another 50% reduction in pesticide use. Well, what we did uh, at Cornell was to uh, make a study of, I think it was 40 <laughs> different crops, and all of the non-chemical technologies that exist and then examine uh, or ask, well, two questions. Could we in the United States implement a program to reduce pesticide use by 50 percent, and how much would it cost? And that's with technologies we already have available, uh, similar, of course, that Sweden or Denmark or Netherlands are, are implementing. Next slide. Uh, well, skip next one. Now, uh, what, one of the things we want to do, of course, in your trying to uh, reduce pesticide use is make better use of your natural enemies, such as this uh, aphid lion that you see uh, here. Next slide. And that makes making judicious use of, uh, of pesticides. Uh, this is the potato beetle and uh, using crop rotations and uh, short season uh, potatoes. Anyway, there are a lot of different technologies that we can use to deal with some of these uh, serious pests. Next slide. And I'm not talking about total re uh, elimination of pesticides. I'm talking about reducing the amounts that, are, uh, uh, that have to be used through uh, implementation of non-chemical <laughs> controls and through the judicious use of, uh, of pesticides. Uh, and crop rotations are a benefit not only to insect control, but diseases and weeds, and obviously help reduce soil erosion and soil degradation. Next slide. And then, of course, uh, one uh, weapon that we have in pest control against insects is using some of the diseases that affect them. Uh, on the slide here, you see uh, the, the one on your left, the caterpillar on your left, is a healthy <coughs> cabbage looper. The cabbage looper on your right, is one, the whitish one, is uh, full of virus crystals. And these virus crystals have looked like sugar crystals uh, under the microscope. And that animal is totally packed with virus crystals. And uh, it's a highly pathogenic virus, 
If you take two caterpillars, well, such as the next slide, 24 hours later, uh, this is the caterpillar, obviously quite ill. And uh, <laughs> if you just take two caterpillars like that and uh, mix them in 100 gallons of water and spray it over an acre of land, you can kill 98% of the cabbage loopers that are present there. So it's a very effective, highly pathogenic uh, uh, organism. Unfortunately, even though every one of us in this room has eaten the virus in our coleslaw or uh, lettuce and so forth, and not affected us, or at least not that we know, uh, EPA has still not approved the use of this uh, virus uh, yet. Next slide. Now, there are a lot of, uh, and I'm not going to go through all of those, that's just a list of some of the non-chemical controls that are available to us that we can uh, uh, use and implement <coughs> to reduce pesticide use. And uh, you can't, there isn't any one of them that is perfect, and what we should be doing is being very selective and using those that uh, are most appropriate, and I guess it's uh, what, pro what Professor Pettigo said is very appropriate. There is no silver bullet for pest control, and we ought to be using a combination depending on the particular situation, the pest and the environment, the crop, and, uh, and so forth. Next slide. But it does illustrate the complexity that we're dealing with. And this is a shot in Kansas. Uh, that the late Professor Painter uh, provided me, showing you wheat on the right here that's susceptible to the Hessian fly, and wheat on your left that is resistant to the Hessian fly. And so this is one more technology uh, that is available to us and can be used effectively depending on the crop, depending on the pest, and, and so forth. Next slide. Now, uh, well, skip that one, the next <coughs> one. Oh. <laughs> That's the last one. That's, well, anyway, I know what, the, what I hope to be my last slide uh, is that, that we could achieve a 50% reduction in pesticide use in the United States. You can turn the lights on. Uh, and without a, uh, a reduction in yield, without a change in cosmetic standards, <coughs> and that we could do this with an increase in food prices of only 0.6%. Now, I want to also emphasize that this calculation of a 0.6% increase in food cost implementing a 50% reduction in pesticide use does not include the benefits of public health, of reducing pesticides uh, on public health, or reducing pesticides on the environment. If you take into consideration those benefits, then of course, uh, in general, there should be a net benefit uh, to society uh, by reducing pesticide use by 50%. And it can be done as a uh, uh, one country has already achieved their 50% reduction, and three others are on, well on their way to achieving this 50% reduction. So this is not something that is pie in the sky. I'd be happy to answer uh, uh, questions for a, well, I guess we got quite a bit of time, don't we? Good. Any comments or questions? Yes, sir. Seems to be a great deal of controversy surrounding the uh, effects, especially of organophosphates, on workers applying these. Have you done any work in this? Do you have any uh, knowledge in that area specifically as to health hazards, <coughs> etc.? Not uh, all that I, well, there are two bits of information. In Central America, where we were uh, working on cotton, uh, of course, the, I was going to say the workers were careless. I should really put it the other way around. That is that the managers of these farms were very careless. They sprayed these workers while they were in the, in the field. They allowed the, fi the field workers to go into the field to uh, pick cotton or weed right after the fields had been treated. 
Uh, and so that they were getting wet with the pesticide in there. And <coughs> that, of course, we don't do in the U.S., uh, but even in the U.S., right after DDT was banned, and there was an increase in parathione and several of these other uh, more toxic materials, there was about a threefold increase in uh, the number of uh, uh, deaths in the U.S. Now, uh, one has to say, if we were careful, uh, there shouldn't be these deaths because we know how to handle it uh, safely and so forth, but of course accidents do, do happen. And in uh, Central America, we also would know how to handle it, but it's not being done. And I'm not just blaming Central America. I mean, it's occurred elsewhere. I mentioned Central America only because we worked there for a while. Yes? because I know in Sweden and some of these other countries, they did shift to some of these more toxic materials uh, that you can apply, for example, ounces per acre instead of pounds per acre. And so that's cheating a little bit. Uh, but uh, there's no good way of measuring, but that's what we did. But we did not substitute more toxic material for, we were strictly using the same materials uh, either reducing the, the dosages or reducing the times treated or totally eliminating uh, some of the treatments, but we did not use more toxic materials to achieve this 50% reduction. We could have done that. Yes? Uh, one of those, one of those uh, points that could be made, though, about the reduction of cotton versus corn, yeah. as wasn't part of that reduction due to the shift of pyrethroids, which are very much more active and that's been held up as a real reduction when it's really in terms of amount of uh, fre the frequency and so forth is still there. It's just that the, the material is more active where it appears right. that there was a reduction. When in corn, we haven't gone to the pyrethroids. So really, yeah. it's, it's I'm not sure that, that cotton has gone yeah. down relative to corn. No, that's a, that's a good point. And pyrethroids have their problems environmentally. Yes. How much of an impact of that training put on the farmers when they make that switch from pesticide use to less pesticide use? That's a that's a good question. Pest to control or whatever. Yeah, to make the shift, yeah, you couldn't do it overnight. Uh, well, I'd say in general, sustainable agriculture is more knowledge intensive than uh, regular conventional agriculture, so it takes more knowledge. Uh, to, really, we're substituting <coughs> knowledge for chemicals. Now, to do that, of course, it means that you've got to train people uh, to use this new knowledge and new approaches, and that would take uh, time to achieve. As I say, Sweden did it in five years. Uh, some of the other countries are, have plans to do it in about 10 years. But uh, it's not substituting Alternative technologies for chemicals will take training and knowledge. Definitely. Yes. Do you see the trade-offs with um, more, uh, with more fertilizer going to be applied, or more um, energy-intensive agriculture with that fifty percent growth? The tr the trade-offs. Yes. Is there, are there any other environmental trade-offs such as uh, increased fertilizer use or no, no, no. There, there, there would be no increased fertilizer use. No, uh, we did in decrease the fertilizer use in that sustainable system that we had there through use of, well, first of all, keeping the soil in place, that is, uh, preventing 20 tons of soil in, uh, <coughs> being lost from the land. And you know, each, this, each ton of soil has about four kilos of, uh, of nitrogen plus other uh, nutrients. Uh, but making use of livestock manure in that particular system. Now, it did cost us some labor, of course, to do that, but as far as reducing the pesticides, no, there was no impact on the uh, fertilizer uh, uh, use in, in any of this, and without any reduction in yield. So it would increase energy use? And, uh, no, it would actually, I would say that we, 
on corn, there was decreased energy, but I wouldn't want to say that for all the other crops because we never uh, looked at it. You have to really look at that crop by crop. In general, I would guess that it, uh, it wouldn't increase the amount of energy, but I wouldn't want to say that it decreased it either at this, at this moment. Any yeah. Well, I think that Sweden and Denmark have seen pretty progressive events coming to polarization. So I think about the U.S. and I don't see it in the same way. Do you think that the climate is changing enough in this country that such a 50% reduction could be mandated by the U.S. EPA? Uh, the question here is um, uh, Sweden and, and Denmark appear to be progressive and uh, will we ever in the United States achieve this type of a change? I think we will, uh, but if I look for the DD, banning DDT as the model <coughs> decision, then I would say it'd take us 10 years after Sweden to get to the point where we will make a similar decision. But I think the climate is certainly coming and remember, the change in Sweden and Denmark, uh, Netherlands or probably one here, did not come from agriculture or in a monitor. It came from the politicians listening to the people. Now already in the United States in a survey uh, by Food and Drug Administration, I don't know whether it was 97 or 96 percent, somewhere in that vicinity, of the public are concerned about pesticides in their food today. And uh, so that there is a growing, a growing concern and the credibility of EPA has dropped uh, significantly during the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And so uh, there is this climate and pressure to try to do something about it. And, and certainly once we see the success of Sweden and Denmark and Norway too, although they haven't passed legislation, but they're certainly well on their way. And the Netherlands uh, and the province of Ontario, and incidentally in Ontario, uh, the specialist who's in charge of uh, reducing, uh, is implementing the program to reduce pesticide use, uh, I thought the farmers would be resistant to this. And he told us the opposite. He said the farmers are highly supportive of this a uh, whole program to reduce pesticide use, and he said there are three reasons. One, pesticides cost them money. Two, they're the ones that are applying these toxic materials, and they're being exposed, their family's being exposed, and three, they also have a concern about the environment. I must admit, I didn't expect this, uh, I'm not talking about all three, not just the last one, but they're really highly supportive of this program up there in, in Ontario. Now, I don't know about Sweden and Denmark. Uh, well, I never asked a question uh, there. Uh, someone else had a question. Yes, sir? Your use of the word pesticide, does that include herbicides or not? Herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides, <coughs> right. And then in the actual reduction <coughs> that we looked at in our paper in achieving this reduction, we could achieve the greatest reduction in herbicides, second in insecticides, and least of fungicides. I'm sure you're aware there's been some interesting work done in this state on lowering the use of herbicides through changing techniques. It seems to me that, that a generation ago when people rotated regularly and many of the other what uh, I term more common sense practices were still used, I don't, what do you see that the big reason why people don't consider that? Well, there are, well, you have other people here that know more about Iowa than I do, but, uh, but you know, price supports has played a very important role in reducing crop rotation, and it's also played a very important role in separating uh, livestock production from, uh, uh, with, integrated with uh, grain production. And so there's a whole array in the marketing orders as far as changing cosmetic standards, not that that's important in grain so much. But there have been a whole array of factors that the government, I'm talking about federal government, 
has played a very important role in encouraging soil erosion, encouraging fertilizer use, and encouraging pesticide use. And so one first step would be to get the damn government straightened out and supportive of sustainable agriculture and reducing uh, our reliance on, on chemicals. And that would be the very first step. And let me indicate again, I think we could go beyond a 50% reduction if you will allow changes in uh, price supports and deficiency payments and marketing orders. And you also allowed us to use pesticides at dosages that are effective instead of using the label dosages on the uh, can. And I uh, mentioned this this afternoon. I have one of my past students in Norway who's working with fruit. And he has demonstrated clearly that in using certain insecticides, that using one-fifth or one-tenth the dosage that's on the label, he can get more effective control. And I want to emphasize more effective control because he's he can save uh, the natural enemy and make use of them in the pest control system. So now if you let me <coughs> do some research and determine the appropriate dosages, we could go further in that uh, reduction. Uh, if you allow me all those changes, cosmetic standards, marketing, price supports, and getting the proper dosage, I think we could go to a 70 or 